Jay, did you bring us in? <laughs> I want to hear this guy from Sabbath School. I gave him a hard time, but he's had a really tough week. And what Jay was talking about is, is some supernatural stuff that is filtering down here. Not today, but has filtered down here. Can you hear me okay? Or do I need to speak up? You're on your lapel. Pardon me? Is it too low? No, I'm just saying you're speaking into the pulpit, and yet I have that off. You're on the lapel. Oh, okay. Thank you. I actually struggled with what I wanted to share this morning because, well, first of all, I had... Thank you, Jerry. First of all, I've been working on a sermon in my head for the next time I came to New Smyrna, and I didn't expect it to be this week, and I wasn't finished. I'll give you a little heads up on it. It's from uh, Revelation chapter 2, the second church of the seven churches, which is Smyrna. You got it. You're not calling New Smyrna for nothing. Amen. It's very prophetic. Yes, sir. There's only two churches, I'm going to digress here a little bit. There's only two churches of the seven that, for which there is never a rebuke. Woo. One is Philadelphia and the other one is Smyrna. Smyrna was the one faithful up until the church merged with the state. Are you listening to me? You see where I'm going to go with this? Whoa. We got some deep stuff that's coming up on us because, I don't know, it's kind of frustrating sometimes. But I did four sermons during this, uh, in the months of March and April and May that were videoed. And what I want to share today is kind of a, I apologize, Ricky, the name in the bulletin is not the one I'm doing. It's okay. <laughs> The here. one I had uh, told Ricky I was going to do like yesterday was faith or fear, or faith and fear. Same, faith or fear, ellipsis, faith and fear. There is a good fear, by the way. It's called fear of God. Yes, sir. Not a little bitty virus. And certainly not bureaucrats. But this one that I've chosen today is called uh, Another Look at Rendering to Caesar. Another Look at Rendering to Caesar. Because mm -hmm. I'm convinced, and I'm just one frail human being, I'm convinced that Rendering to Caesar has been flipped on its head. Because it's predicated upon rendering first to God. Amen. Not first to Caesar, but first to God. I thought about opening with a little song. But since I can't sing. <laughs> oh, come on, Stacy. She can sing. But my mind, I woke up this morning with a song on my boy on, on my mind. And I was up. I wake pretty early. I didn't end up getting up very early, but I was awake pretty early. Oh, we have to get up pretty early. We, it's a two-hour drive over here. <clears throat> this song was on my mind. Let me, let me lay the context for you. The, in, yeah, the, yeah, the context. The setting is the word I was looking for. Flashback in your minds, those of you who are close to my age. Maybe a couple of you are. Flashback to about 1954, 1955. I'm in Sabbath school. Guess what? Now, the setting is this. I'm in deep east Texas. There's still white and colored bathrooms in my town. Can any of you relate to that? There's still the railroad track separates the town from the blacks from the whites. There's still separate schools. There's still separate swimming pools. All that. Here's a song we used to sing. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. 
red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Amen. Sounds pretty inclusive to me. Amen. We're going backwards. We're not going frontwards. We're going backwards. Maybe I'll say more about that later. Back 250 or so years ago, just grabbing the number, after 87 grueling days, and they were grueling, 87 grueling days. Can you imagine six days a week being locked up in a room? No air conditioning, can't open the windows, shades are drawn for 87 days. God hacked out through these men the finest constitution in the history of the world. Amen. And when they exited the hall, there in Philadelphia, there was a woman standing out there, as the story goes, and she calls out Dr. Franklin. Old Ben, he was the oldest guy there. Thank God there was a couple old guys in there. Most of them were young. <laughs> Dr. Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? And Ben was quoted as saying, Madam, we've given you a republic. Not a democracy. You call, recoil, brothers and sisters, when you hear that word. This is not a democracy. Madam, we have given you a republic if you can keep it. Amen. We have lost it. Almost. Hanging by a thread. Just a couple of thoughts along that line that have come to my mind over these last four and a half months. And I think I drive my wife crazy sometimes because I'm always, I had this talk. I'm thinking about this. I connect this talk. Two things that really is stuck in my mind. Number one, and this is related to rendering the season, believe it or not. The more urbanized a country become, becomes, the more government dependent they are. The more urbanized a country becomes, the less they depend upon God. That connects to what just, we just got back 36 hours ago from Tennessee. We sat in a little tent that said, keep Brooklyn Townsend the judge. Keep Judge Brooklyn Townsend. And we must have talked, I don't know, Stacy, how many people have we talked to? This, this is Polk County, Tennessee. Those people are rural. Not too many of them went beyond high school. But I'm going to tell you what, they're smarter than that group up in Washington. You know why? Because they have common sense. That was struck me. I kept talking to these guys my age and older. I said, man, the common sense just oozes out of these people. You could talk to them, you know, whether it be Jesus or the Constitution. It was common sense. Be careful of that word experts, by the way. <laughs> A republic, if you can keep it. Father in heaven, who's worthy to stand here? I'm certainly not. But I want to thank you for the prophetic word that we as Seventh-day Adventists historically have clung to, and now it seems like we're just clinging to anything but. Excuse my frustration, oh Lord. But these times have been foretold that your servant, Ellen White, said that this country would eventually repudiate every principle of its constitution. We are living in. We're rendering to Caesar, forgetting that our founders never wanted that. They wanted us to render to God. And then we could appropriately render to Caesar. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. For settling this old man down up here. In Jesus' name, amen. i got to say one more thing before I get into the message. <clears throat> I'm sick and tired of hearing that the court said something. Or the Supreme Court decided. 
the Supreme Court decided in 1856, 57, that slaves were human property. That was the Supreme Court. Were you going to agree with that one? The Supreme Court in 1896, with the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, said, like I just described up here, we'll have black schools here, white schools here. We'll have black bathrooms here, white bathrooms there. That was Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. Would you agree with that? By the way, Abraham Lincoln, really, his, his uh, candidacy really took off when he publicly opposed and said it was a, a bad law, Dred Scott was. Just like in 2015, that was a bad law. Obergefell versus Hodges, which declared that marriage could be between a man and a man. That's a bad law. I don't accept it. I obey it in the sense that the, the law says, but I don't agree with it, and I reject it. I don't render to Caesar on that one. I go to jail before I'd be forced to do a marriage between a man and a woman. Would you? I question your Christianity if you wouldn't. I don't judge it, but I would question it. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Jesus was speaking to us here. He's always speaking to us. But he was, as far as his message is concerned, he was especially speaking to us. In fact, when we begin to read between the lines, as it were, in Matthew 22, and I'm going to be looking at Matthew 22, uh, Romans 13, and Revelation 13, if I get to it today. I'm going to try my best. You see, everything that Jesus, Matthew 22, pick it up at verse 15, Everything that Jesus is telling us is for our good. And not only for our good, but for our knowledge, for our insight today. If we're willing to connect some dots. Which the Holy Spirit can help us do. Before I read, uh, I brought a book into the pulpit and I wonder, well, maybe you shouldn't have done that, but it's okay. I have a book here. I've never read. I've read parts of it. It's really hard. Really hard. It's written by an actuary. You know what an actuary is? Numbers. Figures. <laughs> you know an actuary, a table, and all that kind of stuff? That's the easy stuff. This is called, the book, this book is called The Predictable Surprise. It was written about 10 years ago. And I, one of my best friends knows this dude. This guy is the preeminent authority on the social security system. It's called a predictable surprise. Meaning it's going bye-bye. And that's why Jesus speaks to us today. He says the world is coming to an end. But we can know along the way those events that he predicted that will surprise most people. And while they may be a little startling to us, they don't have to surprise us. Here's one of them, 22, 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they went to him, and they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you're true. Teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone. Or, you know, you know, you're not a respecter of persons. For you do not regard the person of man. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? <laughs> Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, a man's wages for a day. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. They are. The and he said to them, Therefore, render therefore to Caesar 
the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. These words are often just kind of skipped over. Okay, we obey the government, we obey God. We obey you know, separation of church and state. We obey God, and it is. I don't tell you something. It's not separation of God and state. That's where the error is really grabbing us by the throat. Separation of church and state is not the same as separation of God and state. Are you clear about that? The principles upon which true laws are made, and I've talked to the daughter a little bit about this, are based upon biblical principles. Where do those biblical principles come from? Talk more about that. We're going to go to Romans chapter 13, 1 to 7. Romans chapter 13. This is a really controversial. This could be a series right here, but we're just going to hopefully stir up your pure minds just a little bit. This is a great apostle Paul. He's on the um, He's on the home stretch of this great epistle, the greatest epistle on the gospel ever written. And he covers the whole nine yards, so to speak. And in verse chapter 13, he gets into the government. In the Caesar, if you please. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no government, no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. I laugh every time I read that now that I've studied this. Paul has some satire going on here. You better wake up. And we'll look at that. Therefore, whoever he was, he was capable of satire. You know the difference between satire and sarcasm? Satire is using a turn of phrase to make a point that has a little ironic twist to it. Sarcasm, at least as I understand, is more selfishly inappropriate. Therefore, whoever risks the authority, who resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will be judgment on themselves. For terror, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Satire. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. Satire. It's true, but in this context, it's satire. And you've got to understand this, I believe. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. True. Therefore, you must subject. You must be subject. When the government calls for the mark of the beast, are you to be subject? Obviously, Paul doesn't say it fits in every every shoe doesn't fit this. Is that make, is that clear? So we got to think a little bit here. <clears throat> For he is God's minister to ex execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Very similar to what Jesus said, right? On the end there. Would you agree with that? Now let's just quickly go to Revelation 13. I'm going to have to have you guys stand up to stretch your legs. You don't just get rolling. Revelation 13. <clears throat> Verse 1, then I, then I, John, stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. The seventh heaven is who? We've studied that and believe. And well, I shouldn't say just seventh heaven. The room for reformers 500 years ago saw this to be wrong. So it's not new with us. Been around long before there was a seven day Adventist. We've only been around 176 years. Well, not officially as a church, but since our basic founding. Now we go down to verse 11 and we pick up the other beast.
coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Don't call it a lamb like beast. It's not. It's a beast that has lamb like horns. That specificity, I believe, is very crucial. Because the focus is on the horns here, because they're going to go away. Who are the horns? I believe it would be religious liberty, i.e., Protestantism. True Protestantism is rooted, is rooted out of, or comes out of religious liberty. And civil liberty, which is being just stomped on every day these days with very little pushback. Amen. That's the other one. But he spoke like a what? Right. So who's he connecting back to? The first one. That's what Raymond and I were talking just a little bit about that this morning, early. I mean, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs. Do you want to be obeying that beast at that point? No. If you're going to literally take Jesus and literally take Paul that I just read, then you're going to be obeying that beast. If you don't know when to push back, when are you going to push back? If you wait for the big one until the calendar flips over the first day of the week, it's going to be too late. If you run with the footman and they have weird you, how are you going to contend with the horseman and the swelling of the Jordan? Whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth. In the sight of man. And he just sees those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. And was wounded by the sword and lived. And he granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Neither place should we pick out a erroneous thought that says we obey without discernment. That's been my number one. I'm speaking as one human being here. It's been my number one concern about the response to this shutdown. It's been the lack of discernment. Maybe I should say this now, Stacy. Stacy and I have, a, have signed a contract on a house out in Fort West, Texas. As far as we know, there's not a Seventh-day Adventist in the whole county. We know there's not a church in a three-county area. The county is twice as big as Volusia. It has 2,200 people. And our whole purpose for going there is to be a witness. If we... Unless God shuts it down in the next six weeks. And when, what really convinced us that this, I shouldn't say, really, maybe I'll talk more of this before when we come back. But the thing that really was the catalyst, for me at least, was our realtor. She says to us, what, about the third or fourth meeting? She said, I perceive that you, that's not honor the Sabbath. My husband and I just started keeping it. Wow. Along with another couple. We're not saying they had this. But they're convinced that the Sabbath is God's day. Wow. That's a big wow for us. A big wow. Let's look briefly at the context of each of those passages again. I don't think I, I think I want to move right on over to Paul pretty quickly. But it's pretty clear, I'll just say this, it's pretty clear that Jesus is declaring that Caesar has a lane and God has a lane. And what, and again, I'm going back to the point, I can't emphasize this enough. I'm very concerned. This separation of God and state has evolved, even among us, to separation of church and state. I mean, church is separate, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Separation of church and state has evolved over a separation of God and state. 
But Jesus is also for perfectly clear that Caesar's lane is still God's lane, no matter how mess, mess, big of a mess Caesar makes of it. 